All right, welcome Chemistry 241 guys. We've got some problem solving uh, that we encountered today that I think threw a few of you for a loop and that's fine. It's okay, that's why we're learning. That's why we're gonna do some examples. That's why you have your online homework to kind of get you more practice. You also have the QSC available three nights a week. You have the SI, uh, you know, Austin's there to help you guys. So you have plenty of resources. Dr. Cook and I are happy to help you. So you need to take it on to yourself and take responsibility for your learning. So get the support you need. Don't complain and just mope around. If you're having a hard time, do something about it. Empower yourself, go get help. We're here to help you. So um, in order to try to help you even more, I'm gonna uh, try to do my best to kind of talk through um, how I solve these kinds of problems. Now again, there are many, many ways. There's about probably two or three different ways you can solve these problems, I guess, maybe even more. Um, you know, and, and if you find one that works for you, that's good. However, I'm going to tell you the one that I use because it works for basically any problem that you're going to encounter, and it really helped keep the math, the algebra, to um, pretty, pretty easy uh, form using the approximation I showed you in class. So here's a good example. It's a little bit more challenging, but you know what? I hope you're here to be challenged and you're here to develop your critical thinking skills. So here's this really, I think, fun and applicable problem to the real world. So we've got EDTA, right? And you should remember from your handout roughly what EDTA looks like. And we've got some nasty toxic mercury. And when that mercury is in uh, aqueous solution, it's actually gonna be this uh, tetra aqua complex, which is, you know, it's, it's not good. You don't want that in solution. So if you can use the EDTA to kind of gobble it up and wrap it up so you can deal with it, you'll get this really nice EDTA complex. You're gonna displace the four aqua ligands and so they become free water, which is in the liquid form. And this is really important. You gotta go back. And again, if you don't remember your 111 equilibrium notes, uh, you need to go back and look at those because this is gonna build on that. The K value is worth looking at, and man, 10 to the 21st is really, really high, um, super high. I would say that essentially, um, you know, we write this as an equilibrium arrow, but for all intents and purposes, that is a forward reaction arrow. But we still need to think about the mathematical implications of what does it mean to solve for equilibrium concentrations. So, what do you do? You say, okay, what's going on here? Well, we've got some what? We've got some of the mercury waste, so we got some of this stuff, and here's the, the amounts and, and what the concentration is. And then we've added some EDTA. So unlike the first problem in the handout when we did in class, I kind of gave you the product and I told you to work backwards. Now this one, we're gonna have to kind of do a little bit of a trick. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and think about what are the initial concentrations, right? What are the initial concentrations, because that will let me kind of know what, what's gonna happen here. So again, I'm not looking for equilibrium concentrations right now, I'm thinking about what's actually gonna happen right when we add everything together. Now this is gonna be really critical here. You got 250 mils of the mercury. To that, you're gonna add 250 mils of the EDTA, so this is really important that you need to keep track of this total volume, right? The total volume is gonna be equal to 250 plus 250 and let's not forget our units and when you do that what do you get you find out that you have 500 milliliters total that's going to be really important because all this is in one beaker together so you need to find the new concentration right so basically you can do this on your own it's not that hard but essentially if you have 0.2 molar uh, of anything and you dilute it by the same amount of volume, it's going to be diluted by half. So basically our initial concentration of the mercury is going to be 0 0.100 molarity and you got to write a unit there, it's really important. Same thing for this EDTA, when you dump it in it gets diluted and you're going to start with 0.1 molar EDTA, 0.1 molar of the tetra chloro, or sorry, tetra aqua uh, mercury 2, and that's really important. And so if you just tried to solve right here, you would have a problem because you could set up a nice table and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is that your K is too, too large. There's no way you can do a, a simple approximation. Now, you know, you could argue that in this case, the math is really trivial because it's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, but I'm trying to get you to think about future examples. I mean, even the one we did in class, you ended up having a cubic. And if you want to solve that by hand, you go ahead, but I'm going to try to help you think about what goes on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to assume, and this is an important assumption, I'm going to write this down because I want to keep track of it. I'm going to assume that the reaction is going to go in the forward direction pretty much to completion. So 
I've got sort of a limiting reagent problem here. I've got two things. It's one to one. Oh, but actually that's kind of cool because it's exactly the same amount. Look at that. So you could say either ni neither of them or both of them are the limiting reagents. So basically, if, I, if I'm if i going to shift, I'm going to say, for just a first second, I'm going to say this is just a one-way reaction. I draw my big old arrow here. And I'm going to say, okay, well, if that's the case, um, I'm going to use all of this up so I can minus 0.1. I'm going to use all of this up, minus 0.1. Uh, we're going to say we had zero of this complex to begin with, and we're going to go plus 0.1. So that means that the initial concentration of this one, once we get done, is now going to be 0 0.1. I'll go ahead and throw all these extra sig figs in a unit. Now, do we care about water? Well, no, we don't care about water because water is a solvent. Water is a pure liquid. It does not, as we'll see in a minute, does not show up in the equilibrium expression. So we don't even care about water. Plus, if you really think about it, if you're dealing with the water as a solvent, it's, a, it's concentration really, it, it makes no sense to say it changes because you have so much water. Water's like 55, 54 molar. It's crazy. You're not going to change the concentration if you're running a reaction in it at reasonable concentrations. And 0.1 molar is pretty reasonable. Okay, so what does that mean now? What that means then is I'm going to say that this is kind of my new starting condition because I'm going to say, okay, before I jump into the equilibrium, I'm going to say, I'm just going to kind of go with this K value. It's so big. I'm going to say it, it's kind of gone to completion and I'm going to have really none of this left over and none of this left over. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the equilibrium to work backwards because I know that it's not going to go backwards very far at all. And so it's going to be pretty close to 0.1. And again, that gets to that idea of by using this, if we know the forward reaction has a large K, the backwards reaction, right, the reverse reaction, is gonna, it's gonna have a K that's equal to one over this KF, which means it's gonna be tiny. And when you have a tiny K, uh, K value, that's what you want, because when you have tiny K values, you're not gonna get much movement of concentration. And when you don't have much movement in concentration, that's when you can apply the really good approximation that we talked about. If you have really large Ks, you can solve that, but you can't use the approximation because you're gonna have really big jumps in concentration or really big falls in concentration. So in order to get away with that approximation, you need to go in the direction that's gonna give you the smallest K. We'll see many more examples of this when we talk about solubility. So bear with me for a minute. Okay, so if we assume it goes one way, we're gonna assume that the new initial concentration or initial condition will be basically 0 0.100 right molar complex of mercury with the really awesome ligand EDTA and it overall has a charge of 2 minus so that's going to be my starting condition and if that's my starting condition the rest of it's really trivial so now we can set up an, a nice table Okay, so now I'm gonna treat this like equilibrium. And so I'm gonna make sure that I put my little brackets here. I'm gonna look at my initial, I'm gonna look at my change, I'm gonna look at equilibrium, that's really important. So let's think about what's happening here. We, we kind of shifted the reaction, we assumed it went to completion uh, as our new starting condition, and we're gonna say we have no naked EDTA, we have no mercury by itself. And again, we said that all of it goes into 0.1 molar complex with EDTA water we don't care we don't we don't need to know what the concentration with water we don't need we don't even need to care what the concentration of water is because it's not part of the equilibrium expression really really important okay now if this is the case what is our what is our Q well we see our Q value is going to tell us that we have no reactant so we're gonna to have to shift just ever so slightly in this direction now not much right because if you actually look at the the K for the reverse reaction, what is that gonna look like? The K for the reverse reaction, it's pretty crazy. It's like 3.1 times 10 to the negative 22nd. And how do we get that number? This is basically equal to one over KF. Remember that when you reverse a reaction, you take one over the K value, really important. You don't take the negative because negative K doesn't make any sense. It's gotta be a positive number. Okay. So we're looking at the reverse reaction. And so we know that in this case, we're gonna be losing some of the EDTA complex and there's a one in front of this, so it's just X. 
There's a one in front of the Mercury and the one in front of EDTA. So these are gonna go up by X. We are very, very fortunate here that we don't have non, non one. So remember in the previous example we did in class, we had like a two here or something like that. And that can be problematic, but just having ones is super easy because zero plus X, that's X. Zero plus X is X. 0 0.100 minus X. I'm gonna drop the units for a little bit while I do the math. And so now I can write my new equilibrium expression. I can say K reverse, if you wanna call it that, or whatever you wanna call it. You can call it Bob or Susan, I don't care. And now what I'm gonna do, is, since I'm going in the backwards direction, I'm gonna write my equilibrium expression with the backwards direction in mind. So I've got my EDTA, and I wanna know my uh, equilibrium concentration of EDTA because we're dealing with K's so we're dealing with equilibrium you need to show me that and then I've got a complex of the uh, mercury um, the, the was it the tetra aqua mercury 2 I'll put that in there and put my brackets around that there's my equilibrium and then my reactant in this case since I'm going backwards is the overall mercury EDTA complex okay I think I get that there I know sometimes the brackets get a confusing but you get the idea so that's my new uh, K reversible now notice water again we don't care about the change in water we don't care about the equilibrium concentration of water because water is a pure liquid it does not have any role in the equilibrium expression you have to remember that pure liquids pure solids no role at all in the equilibrium expression so now I can go ahead and plug in my values I get an X here for the EDTA equilibrium concentration. I get an X for the uh, mercury compound. And then finally, I get my concentration of the mercury EDTA complex. I'm going to use my approximation. Since this K is tiny, 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 I'm going to assume that X is really small compared to 0.1. So that means my approximation is X squared over 0.100 which equals the K reversible value. We'll bring that down here. That equals 3.1 times 10 to the negative 22nd. There we go. So this is what we will solve. And that's like a laughably easy algebraic expression, right? You just multiply both sides by 0.1 and take the square root. And when you do that, you should get X equals something like 5.6 times 10 to the negative 12 molarity you have to put the unit you can't just solve the algebra and be like i'm done i'm out of here see ya no you got to tell me what that is and in this case we were looking for what in particular we were looking for the unchelated mercury which happens to be the aqua complex so you got to show me what the question is asking for as an answer and do that whole thing so there you go so your final take-home answer here is right there you see how this is far less, far less than 5% of that initial concentration, that 0.1. So our approximation is valid. In fact, you know, many of you in your homework or in this activity did a good job. You said that this approximation is valid because I would promise you 10 to the negative 12 is nowhere close to 10 to the negative 1. That's way less than 1%. And so I know some of you will choose not to do the work this way, and that is your prerogative. You are young men, young adults, and you can make your decisions, but please make sure you find a way that can show your work and get it right every time. Um, again, this the mathematic, mathematical operations are, is not, it's not challenging here. The, I would argue the challenging part of this is looking at the chemistry and thinking about ways to attack this problem and getting it right with your understanding of both equilibrium and what's going on and maybe how to kind of frame the problem and use that critical thinking to get at a better way of solving this. So anyway, this wasn't that hard. I know some of you were stressed about this, but I was so pleased that so many of you got this right. You worked hard or you got help, and that is awesome. So again, you have the QSC available, you have SI available, and you have the instructors. So you need if you, this is a hard topic for you, you need to get that help and get going because we have an exam coming up this week, and it's not going to fall in your lap. You've got to work for it. It's an intermediate level class. We're not going to spoon feed you. If you need help, you got to go and get it and you can do that there are so many resources here on campus there's no excuse not to get help all right um, take care and we'll solve more of these problems on wednesday